On August 18, some irate residents of Donkokrum set the police station there on fire in protest over some police officers who fled after being allegedly involved in a bullion van attack which led to the death of the driver. The police administration warned it will not assign police officers to Donkokrum and T's in the eastern region until a police station that was destroyed by the residents of the area is rebuilt. The attempted uh, a robbery led to the death of the driver of the van after a heated exchange of gunfire between the police service and some uh, robbers. And let's get onto the phone lines and do some discussion around this very visit by the Inspector General of Ghana Police Service. We've been joined on the phone lines by Dr. Kingsley Ajay. He is a security expert and also with the uh, University of Cape Coast. Uh, good evening, sir, and thanks for your time on News at 10 tonight. Good evening. Now, how crucial is this visit by the IGP to Donkokrum tomorrow? Yes, um, I think uh, when the issue cropped up, um, the media house called me and I told them that we need a big voice. Um, so it's a good decision taken by the IGP. Uh, the first person who made a statement on the issue um, to the effect that the police would not be there and uh, the buildings and all that that had been uh, destroyed would should be reconstructed by the community and all that did not do well in that statement you know the absence of the police gives a leeway for miscreants to commit their crimes and so the police really is one of the institutions that represent the face of the state in every uh, space of the of the country so for a place to have gone, uh, for uh, a statement like that to have been made meant that the people were going to be deserted. And mind you, it is not everybody in that village or in that town that took part in what the young men there did. So I believe the decision of the IGP uh, to step in and to address the issue where perhaps the police will come face to face uh, and uh, with with the community and uh, try to settle the matter, I believe, is the best way out. In doing so, however, I think that if anybody did anything that could be seen as criminal towards the people of the community and also towards the police, uh, they must be uh, treated as such. Uh, otherwise, people would take that as a chance to do such things in other places, that you can attack the police, that a policeman can do anything that he likes in a community and go scot-free. That in itself is, is, is not the best way uh, to go about it. So I believe while they are coming together to settle the matter, they, they must also have recourse to those who may have committed crimes and deal with them accordingly. Now, co considering the fact that the Ghana Police Service is saying that they are going to withdraw personnel from the town because its uh, station there was burnt uh, by residents, does it make sense for the police service uh, which is uh, taxed or which has the right to protect residents of the country to uh, uh, threaten to abandon its role as uh, peace officers? No, they, 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 they can't do that. But also we must uh, look at the situation from uh, the very, very um, origin of it. You know, uh, you have policemen who's, who should be protecting the people themselves taking guns and shooting and killing a bullion vehicle driver. You have uh, policemen who give guns and ammunition to armed robbers to go and attack people. You have policemen who would molest somebody until that person dies. 
And I heard this afternoon, or was it yesterday, that the uh, recruitment exercises that are done, you know, have nothing to do with such situation. I hold a set ex exception to that. I think that the rules and regulations regarding recruitment of the uh, of people into the police service must be that which scrutinizes people and checks their background very well it is true that through resocialization people could change even after they've entered the police uh, service but it is also true that many of these people who go in there are not properly checked they are, are not properly scrutinized to at least investigate their moral, uh, you know, disposition before they, they, they enter the police. So that's now, your, doc, your point has been well yeah. made, but because of lack of time, let me quickly chip in this for you to wrap up. Now, do you think, using the Kudonko Chrome as a case study, do you think that the Ghana Police Service and, of course, the community relationship they've been having in areas they operate in is gradually uh, waning? How's what you may come back come again? I didn't hear you. I'm I'm saying that looking at the yes, just using Donko Chrome as a case study. Do you think that yeah. the kind of relationship we have with the police within communities that they operate in, uh, the relationship they have is waning or is gradually dwindling? Oh, I, I do not think so. This is just um, you know there have been such cases, but I think once in a while you have these cases coming up. But going back to your question, uh, I would say that, no, the police should not abandon the place. Um, there are very fantastic police people in this country. Uh, community police relations are excellent in some other places. Uh, these are some of the things that happen when uh, you have a young democracy that is, that is growing. And uh, there are people who do not understand democratic tenets and would use they have freedoms in excess. And when these things happen, <laughs> I think that it is, it is um, important that the IGP, as he has done, steps in. Let right. me also state before perhaps I leave you that it is on, not only Ghana that you have this police community, you know, conflicts. Even in the United States, we all know what happens uh, between blacks and uh, white policemen and no. all that. The important and the underlying factor is that what do we do to make sure that we repair such strained relationships? So I believe right. the step taken by the IGP to go there tomorrow is good. The police should not say they would abandon that place. It All would right. not augur well for security. We're grateful that you joined us tonight on News at 10. Dr. Kinsley Ajay is a security expert on our school, also a lecturer with the University of Cape Coast there speaking to us about the IGP's intended visit to Donkokrom in the Eastern Region tomorrow. Let's shift our attention to some election-related stories. Now, a pre-election survey conducted by the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, has revealed 71% of Ghanaians abhor vote buying and it should be punishable by law. 42%, however, condone the art but will reject the party, while 5% will vote for the party that buys their votes. The survey, which was conducted between July 2 and 18, pointed out that most Ghanaians prefer to have free and fair elections even if their preferred candidate does not emerge victorious. They were optimistic the upcoming polls will record minor problems. The findings also showed awareness about the polls among the public. More than 9 out of 10 claimed to have registered and have expressed intention to vote, which correspond favorably to 2012, where 76% of electorate expressed same sentiments. On electoral processes, a quarter of Ghanaians believe their votes are not secret and 46% believe it is likely the wrong vote tally will be announced. The study further revealed 51% of Ghanaians believe the NDC engages in vote buying and 32% think the NPP is also involved in the same act. The findings also indicated 46% of Ghanaians source information on election from private radio stations, 37% from private television, whilst 26 
business person also rely on informal sources of news and less than one out of ten rely on the National Commission for Civic Education. Senior Research Fellow of CDD Kojon Pumpuni Asante says the NCC has failed in educating the electorate about this year's election. A lot of Ghanaians uh, report that they are not hearing from the NCC. They seem to get most of their information from private media, from government media and TV. So uh, again, it means that the NCC has to do more work. The findings also showed overwhelming endorsement for the ballot box as the preferred means of selecting public officials and the Electoral Commission as the official body mandated to announce the electoral results also remain unquestioned. So that was a survey conducted by CDD. Now, the survey says that uh, between July 2nd to 18, 2016, they sampled the size of 2,400 people across the country within 163 districts of the country, and they found out that uh, that is the research output that we played for you. Let's go onto the phone lines and speak to Dr. Eric Odrosa. He's Dean of Graduate Studies and Research at the Institute of Local Government Studies. He's going to help us dive delve into this very issue. Good evening, sir, and thanks for your time on News at 10. Good evening. Now, looking at the voter population uh, of Ghana, ranging between 14, 000, uh, 14 million to 15 million and 216 districts, what sample size will be representative for a survey in order for it to be conclusive uh, that uh, that should be the output? Thank you very much. I, I think in, in, in any survey or study, the sample size is very important. Uh, because the characteristics of the, of the sample size is expected to reflect the population. So looking at our total population of uh, 14 million, if you look at the statistics, it is very clear that uh, for any uh, population in excess of 1 million, if the organization or CDD wanted to use a confidence level of 95%, the margin of error of 5%, then the minimum for a population of 1 million should be sample size of 380. That is in the minimum. Looking at Ghana's population of about 14, voter population of about 14 million, if, if you stretch that argument, what it then means is that the minimum voter population, uh, minimum uh, sample that we should have used should have been around 5,404, if you look at it like that. But then if they use a sample of 2,500, it may not be out of place, depending on the information-rich content of that particular sample size they use. You know, so there are a lot of factors that come into play. We need to establish the margin of error and the confidence level. When we talk about the confidence level, it is how sure they are that the population, the, the sample accurately reflects the population. What that means is that the sample possesses characteristics in such a way that any conclusion they draw from the sample can be applied on the population with a plus or minus margin of error of about 5%. So I think the uh, sample used truly represents what they should have used looking at the population. So you are saying that a sample is very representative of uh, the research they did? Definitely. That, but that's what I'm saying. Depending on who and who are in the sample. Very well. It, it, it is not so about the numbers, but then it is about how quality because if you have a sample made up of people who don't understand the issues and they give you feedback, you may not get responses that can wholesale be applied to the population. Now, the, the, the research stated that 51% of Ghanaians believe the NDC engages in vote buying and 32% think the MPP is also involved in the same act. Should, should we be worried at, after all? Well, to some extent, it's done by we the two parties. Uh, as a nation, because this is what was concluded from the sample they studied. No matter how we look at it, it they are views that have been expressed by Ghanaians. So as a nation, we should take it on board, and the political parties going into this election should find a way of resolving it, because no serious democracy would allow this particular survey, survey feedback to, to exist. Now what we need to do as a nation is to be able to uh, properly criminalize vote buying as part of our democratic process. It has not been properly criminalized in our law. So it makes it very difficult for you to hold one responsible. 
But once it is criminalized and it is properly defined, once you get any of the parties getting themselves involved in this, I can bet you that the law will take its own course and people will stop. The law is not very clear on what exactly constitutes vote buying. So people are doing it and are getting away with it. That should not be allowed to exist in our country. Well, Doc, for lack of time, let's end it here. We will have some other time to delve into this very issue. Now, Dr. Eric Odrosai is the Dean of Graduate Studies and Research at the Institute of Local Government Studies. That's it for the big one.